Roger Melvin's Burial by Nathaniel Hawthorne One of the few incidents of Indian warfare naturally susceptible in the moonlight of romance was that expedition undertaken for the defense of the frontiers in the year 1725, which resulted in the well-remembered Lovell's Fight. Imagination, by casting certain circumstances judicially into the shade, may seem much to admire in the heroism of a little band who gave battle to twice their number in the heart of the enemy's country. The open bravery displayed by both parties was in accordance with civilized ideas of valor, and chivalry itself might not blush to record the deeds of one or two individuals. The battle, though so fatal to those who fought, was not unfortunate in its consequences to the country, for it broke the strength of a tribe and conduced to the peace which subsisted during several ensuing years. History and tradition are unusually minute in their memorials of their affair, and the captain of a scouting party of frontiermen has acquired as actual a military renown as many a victorious leader of thousands. Some of the incidents contained in the following pages will be recognized, notwithstanding the substitution of fictitious names, by such as heard from old men's lips the fate of the few combatants who were in a condition to retreat after Lovell's fight. The early sunbeams hovered cheerfully upon the treetops, beneath which two weary and wounded men had stretched their limbs the night before. Their bed of withered oak leaves was strewn upon the small level space at the foot of a rock, situated near the summit of one of the gentle swells, by which the face of the country is there diversified. The mass of granite rearing its smooth, flat face surface fifteen or twenty feet above their heads was not unlike a gigantic gravestone upon which the veins seemed to form an inscription in forgotten characters. On a tract of several acres around this rock, oaks and other hardwood trees had supplied the place of the pines, which were the usual growth of the land, and a young and vigorous sapling stood close beside the travelers. The severe wound of the elder man had probably deprived him of sleep, for so soon as the first ray of sunshine rested on the top of the highest tree, he reared himself painfully from his recumbent posture and sat erect. The deep lines of his countenance and the scattered gray of his hair marked him as past middle age. But his muscular frame would but for the effect of his wound have been as capable of sustaining fatigue as in the early vigor of life. Languor and exhaustion now sat upon his haggard features, and the despairing glance which he sent forward through the depths of the forest proved his own conviction that his pilgrimage was at an end. He next turned his eyes to the companion who reclined by his side. The youth, for he had scarcely attained the years of manhood, lay with his head upon his arm in the embrace of an unquiet sleep, which a thrill of pain from his wounds seemed each moment on the point of breaking. His right hand grasped a musket, and to judge from the violent action of his features, his slumbers were bringing back a vision of the conflict, of which he was one of the few survivors. A shout, deep and loud in his dreaming fancy, found its way in an imperfect murmur to his lips, and, starting uh, even at the slight sound of his own voice, he suddenly awoke. The first act of reviving recollection was to make anxious inquiries inspecting the condition of his wounded fellow traveler. The latter shook his head. Reuben, my boy, said he, this rock beneath which we sit will serve for an old hunter's gravestone. There's many and many a long mile of howling wilderness before us yet. Nor would it avail me anything if the smoke of my own chimney were but the other side of that swell of land. That an Indian bullet was deadlier than I thought. Well, you are weary with our three days' travel, replied the youth, and a little longer rest will recruit you. Sit you here while I search the woods for the herbs and roots that must be our sustenance, and having eaten, you shall lean on me, and we will turn our faces homeward. I doubt not that with my help you can attain to some one of the frontier garrisons. There is not two days of life in me, Reuben, said the other calmly, and I will no longer burden you with my useless body when you can scarcely support your own. "'Your wounds are deep and your strength is failing fast. "'Yet if you hasten onward home, you may be preserved, "'for there's no hope, and I will await death here. "'Well, if it must be so, I will remain and watch by you,' "'said Reuben resolutely. "'No, my son, no,' rejoined his companion. "'Let the wish of a dying man have weight with you. "'Give me one grasp of your hand and get you hence. "'Think you that my last moments will be eased "'by the thought that I leave you to die a more lingering death?' I have loved you like a father, Reuben, and at a time like this I should have something of a father's authority. I charge you to be gone that I may die in peace. 
And because you've been a father to, to, uh, to me, should I therefore leave you to perish and lie unburied in the wilderness, exclaimed the youth? No, if your end be truth approaching, I will watch by you and receive your parting words. I will dig a grave here by the rock in which, if my weakness overcome me, we will rest together. Or, if heaven gives me strength, I will seek my way home. In the cities, and wherever men dwell, replied the other, they bury their dead in the earth. They hide them from the sight of the living, but here where no step may pass, perhaps for a hundred years, wherefore, wherefore should I not rest beneath the open sky, covered only by the oak leaves when the autumn wind shall strew them? And for a monument here is this gray rock on which my dying hand shall carve the name of Roger Malvin, and the traveler in days to come will know that here sleeps a hunter and a warrior. Tarry not then for a folly like this, but hasten away if not for your own sake, but for hers, who will else be desolate. Malvin spoke the last few words in a faltering voice, and their effect upon his companion was strongly visible. They reminded him that there were other and less questionable duties than that of sharing the fate of a man whom his death could not benefit. Nor can it be affirmed that no selfish feeling strove to enter Reuben's heart, though the consci consciousness made him more earnestly resist his companion's entreaties. Well, how terrible to wait the slow approach of a death in this solitude, exclaimed he. A brave man does not shrink in the battle, and when friends stand round the bed, every woman may die composedly. But here... I shall not drink even here, Reuben Bourne, interrupted Malvin. I am a man of no weak heart, and if I were, there is surer support than that of earthly friends. You are young, and life is dear to you. Your last moments will need comfort far more than mine, and when you've laid me in the earth and are alone, and night is settling on the forest, you will feel all the bitterness of the death that may now be escaped. But I will urge no selfish motive to your generous nature. Leave me for my sake that having said a prayer for your safety, I may have space to settle my account undisturbed by worldly sorrows. And your daughter, how shall I dare to meet her eye? exclaimed Reuben. She will ask the fate of her father, whose life I vow to defend with my own. Must I tell her that he traveled three days' march with me from the field of battle, and that then I left him to perish in the wilderness? We're not better to lie down and die by your side than to return safe and say this to the Dorcas. Tell my daughter, said Roger Malvin, that though yourself sore wounded and weak and weary, you led my tottering footsteps many a mile, and left me only at my earnest entreaty, because I would not have your blood upon my soul. Tell her that through pain and danger you were faithful, and that if your lifeblood could have saved me, it would have flowed to its last drop. And tell her that you will be something dearer than a father, and that my blessing is with you both, and that my dying eyes can see a long and pleasant path in which you will journey together. As Malvin spoke, he almost raised himself from the ground, and the energy of his concluding words seemed to fill the wild and lonely forest with a vision of happiness. But when he sank exhausted upon his bed of oak leaves, the light which had rekindled in Reuben's eye was quenched. He felt as it were both sin and folly to think of happiness at such a moment. His companion watched his changing countenance, and sought with generous art to wile him to his own good. "'Perhaps I deceive myself in regard to the time I have to live,' he resumed." It may be with speediest persistence I might recover of my wound. The foremost fugitives must ere this have carried tidings of our fatal battle to the frontiers, and parties will be out to succor those in like condition with ourselves. Should you meet one of these and guide them hither, who can tell that I may, be sit my, that I may sit by my own fireside again? A mournful smile strayed across the features of the dying man, as he insinuated that unfounded hope, which, however, was not without its effect on Reuben. No merely selfish motive nor even the desolate condition of Dorcas would have induced him to desert his companion at such a moment. But his wishes seized on the thought that Malvin's life might be preserved, and his sanguine nature heightened almost certainty the remote possibility of procuring human aid. Well, surely there is reason, weighty reason to hope that friends are not far distant, he said, half aloud. There fled one coward unwounded in the beginning of the fight, and most probably he made good speed. Every true man on the frontier should shoulder his musket at the news, and though no party may range so far into the woods as this, I shall perhaps encounter them in one day's march. Counsel me faithfully, he added, turning to Malvin in distrust of his own motives. Were your situation mine? Would you desert me while life remained? It is now twenty years, replied Roger Malvin, sign however as he secretly acknowledged the wide similarity between the two cases. It is now twenty years since I escaped with one dear friend from Indian captivity near Montreal. We journeyed many days through the woods, 
till at length overcome with hunger and weariness, my friend laid down and besought me to leave him. For he knew that if I remained, we both must perish. And with but little hope of attaining succor, I heaped a pillow of dry leaves beneath his head and hastened on. And did you return in time to save him? asked Reuben, hanging on Malvin's words as if they were to be prophetic of his own success. Well, I did, answered the other. I came upon the camp of a hunting party before sunset of the same day. I guided them to the spot where my comrade was expecting death, and he is now a hale and hearty man upon his own farm, far within the frontiers while I lie wounded here in the depths of the wilderness. Well, this example, powerful in affecting Reuben's decision, was aided unconsciously to himself by the hidden strength of many another motive. Roger Malvin perceived that the victory was nearly won. "'Now go, my son, and heaven prosper you,' he said. "'Turn not back with your friends when you meet them, lest your wounds and weariness overcome you, but send hitherward two or three that may be spared to search for me. And believe me, Reuben, my heart will be lighter with every step you take towards home.' Yet there was, perhaps, a change in both his countenance and voice as he spoke thus. For, after all, it was a ghastly fate to be left expiring in the wilderness." Reuben, born but half convinced that he was acting rightly, at length raised himself from the ground and prepared himself for his departure. And first, though contrary to Malvin's wishes, he collected a stock of roots and herbs which had been their only food during the last two days. This useless supply he placed within reach of the dying man, for whom also he swept together a bed of dry oak leaves. Then, climbing to the summit of the rock, which on one side was rough and broken, he bent the oak sapling downward and bound his handkerchief to the topmost branch. This precaution was not unnecessary to direct any who might come in search of Malvin, for every part of the rock except its broad, smooth front was concealed at a little distance by the dense undergrowth of the forest. The handkerchief had been the bandage of a wound upon Reuben's arm, and as he bound it to the tree, he vowed by the blood that stained it that he would return, either to save his companion's life or to lay his body in the grave. He then descended and stood with downcast eyes to receive Roger Malvin's parting words. The experience of the latter suggested much and minute advice respecting the youth's journey through the tra trackless forest. Upon this subject he spoke with calm earnestness as if he were sending Reuben to the battle or the chase while he himself remained secure at home, and not as if the human countenance that was about to leave him were the last he would ever behold. But his firmness was shaken before he concluded, Carry my blessing to Dorcas, and say that my last prayer shall be for her and you. "'Bid her to have no hard thoughts because you left me here.' "'Well, Reuben's heart smote him. "'For that your life would not have weighed with you "'if its sacrifice could have done me good. "'She will marry you after she's mourned a little while for her father, "'and heaven grant you long and happy days. "'May your children's children stand around your deathbed. "'And Reuben,' added he as the weakness of mortality made its way at last, "'return when your wounds are healed and your weariness refreshed. "'Return to this wild rock and lay my bones in the grave and say a prayer over them.' while well, an almost superstitious regard arising perhaps from the customs of the Indians, whose war with the dead as well as the living was paid by the frontier inhabitants to the rites of sepulture. And there are many instances of the sacrifice of life in the attempt to bury those who had fallen by the sword of the wilderness. Well, Reuben therefore felt the full importance of the promise which he most solemnly made to return and perform Roger Malvin's obsequies. It was remarkable that the latter, speaking his whole heart in his parting woods, no longer endeavored to persuade the youth that even the speediest succor might avail to the preservation of his life. Reuben was internally convinced that he should see Malvin's living face no more. While well, his generous nature would fain have delayed him at whatever risk till the dying scene were past. But the desire of existence and the hope of happiness had strengthened in his heart, and he was unable to resist them. "'It is enough,' said Roger Malvin, having listened to Reuben's promise. "'Go, and God speed you.' The youth pressed his hand in silence, turned, and was departing. His slow and faltering steps, however, had borne him but a little way before Malvin's voice recalled him. Reuben. Reuben, said he faintly, and Reuben returned and knelt down by the dying man. Raise me, and let me lean against the rock, was his last request. My face will be turned towards home, and I shall see you a moment longer as you pass among the trees. Reuben, having made the desired alteration in his companion's posture, again began his solitary pilgrimage. He walked more hastily at first and was consistent with his strength, for a sort of guilty feeling which sometimes torments men in their most justifiable acts caused him to seek concealment from Malvin's eyes. But after he'd trodden far upon the rustling forest leaves, 
he crept back, impelled by a wild and painful curiosity, and, sheltered by the earthly roots of an uptorn tree, gazed earnestly at the desolate man. The morning sun was unclouded, and the trees and shrubs imbibed the sweet air of the month of May. Yet there seemed a gloom on nature's face, as if she sympathized with mortal pain and sorrow that Roger Melvin's hands were uplifted in a fervent prayer. Some of the words which stole through the stillness of the woods and entered Reuben's heart, torturing it with an unutterable pang. They were the broken accents of a petition for his own happiness and that of Dorcas. And as the youth listened, conscience or something in its similitude pleaded strongly with him to return and lie down again by the rock. He felt how hard was the doom of the kind and generous being whom he deserted in his extremity. Death would come like the slow approach of a corpse, stealing gradually towards him through the forest and showing its ghastly and motionless features from behind a nearer and yet a nearer tree. But such must have been Reuben's own fate had he tarried another sunset. And who, who shall impute blame to him if he shrinks from so useless a sacrifice? Well, as he gave a parting look, a breeze waved a little banner upon the sapling oak and reminded Reuben of his vow. Many circumstances combined to retard the wounded traveler on his way to the frontiers. On the second day, the clouds gathering densely over the sky precluded the possibility of regulating his course by the position of the sun, and he knew not but that every effort of his almost exhausted strength was removing him farther from the home he sought. His scanty sustenance was supplied by the berries and other spontaneous products of the forest. Herds of deer, it is true, sometimes bounded past him, and partridges frequently whirled up before his footsteps. But his ammunition had been expended in the fight, and he had no means of slaying them. His wounds, irritated by the constant exertion in which lay the only hope of life, wore away his strength, and at intervals confused his reason. But even in the wanderings of intellect, Reuben's young heart clung strongly to existence, and it was only through absolute incapacity of motion that he at last sank down beneath a tree, compelled there to await death. In this situation he was discovered by a party, who upon the first intelligence of the fight had been dispatched to the relief of the survivors. They conveyed him to the nearest settlement, which chanced to be that of his own residence. Dorcas, in the simplicity of the olden time, watched by the bedside of her wounded lover, and administered all those comforts that are in the sole gift of woman's heart and hand. During several days Reuben's recollection strayed drowsily among the perils and hardships through which he had passed, and he was incapable of returning definite answers to the inquiries with which many were eager to harass him. No authentic particulars of battle had yet been circulated, nor could mothers, wives, and children tell whether the loved ones were detained by captivity or by the stronger chain of death. Dorcas nourished her apprehensions in silence until one afternoon, when Reuben awoke from an unquiet sleep and seemed to recognize her more perfectly than at any previous time. She saw that his intellect had become composed and she could no longer restrain her filial anxiety. "'My father, Reuben,' she began, but the change in her lover's countenance made her pause. The youth shrank as if with a bitter pain and the blood gushed vividly into his wan and hollow cheeks. His first impulse was to cover his face, but... Apparently with a desperate effort, he half raised himself and spoke vehemently, defending himself against an imaginary accusation. "'Your father was sore wounded in battle, Dorcas. He bade me not burden myself with him, but only to lead him to the lakeside, that he might quench his thirst and die. But I would not desert the old man in his extremity, and though bleeding myself, I supported him. I gave him half my strength and led him away with me. For three days we journeyed on together, and your father was sustained beyond my hopes, but, awakening at sunrise on the fourth day, I found him faint and exhausted. He was unable to proceed. His life had ebbed away fast, and... He died? exclaimed Dorcas faintly. Reuben felt it impossible to acknowledge that his selfish love of life had hurried him away before her father's fate was decided. He spoke not. He only bowed his head, and between shame and exhaustion, he sank back and hid his face in the pillow. Dorcas wept with her when her fears were thus confirmed, but the shock, as it had been long anticipated, was on the account of the less violent. "'You dug a grave for my poor father in the wilderness, Reuben,' was the question by which her filial piety manifested itself. "'Well, my hands were weak, but I did what I could,' replied the youth in a smothered tone. "'There stands a noble tombstone above his head, and I would to heaven I slept as soundly as he.' Dorcas, perceiving the wilderness of his latter words, inquired no further at the time, but her heart found ease in the thought that Roger Malvin had not lacked such funeral rites as was possible to bestow. The tale of Reuben's courage and fidelity lost nothing when she communicated it to her friends. And the poor youth, tottering from his sick chamber to breathe the sunny air, experienced from every tongue the miserable and humiliating torture of unmerited praise. 
all acknowledged that he might worthily demand the hand of the fair maiden to whose father he'd been faithful unto death. And as my tale is not of love, it shall suffice to say that in the space of a few months, Reuben became the husband of Dorcas Malvin. During the marriage ceremony, the bride was covered with blushes, but the bridegroom's face was pale. There was now in the breast of Reuben born an incommunicable thought, something to which he was to conceal most heedfully from her, whom he most loved and trusted. He regretted deeply and bitterly the moral cowardice that restrained his words when he was about to disclose the truth to Dorcas, but pride and the fear of losing her affection, the dread of universal scorn, forbade him to rectify this falsehood. He felt that for leaving Roger Melvin he deserved no censure. His presence, the gratuitous sacrifice of his own life, would have added only another and a needless agony to the last moments of the dying man. But concealment had imparted to a justifiable act much of the secret effect of guilt. And Reuben, while reason told him that he'd done right, experienced in no small degree the mental horrors which punished the perpetrator of undiscovered crimes. By a certain association of ideas, he at times almost imagined himself a murderer. Well, for years also, a thought would occasionally recur, which, though he perceived all its folly and extravagance, he had not power to banish from his mind. It was a haunting and torturing fancy that his father-in-law was yet sitting at the foot of the rock, on the withered forest leaves, alive and awaiting his pledged assistance. Well, these mental deceptions, however, came and went. Nor did he ever mistake them for reality. But in the calmest and clearest moods of his mind, he was conscious that he had such a deep vow unredeemed, and that an unburied corpse was calling to him out of the wilderness. Yet such was the consequence of his prevarication that he could not obey the call. It was now too late to require the assistance of Roger Melvin's friends in performing his long-deferred sepulture, and the superstitious fears of which none were more susceptible than the people of the outward settlements forbade Reuben to go alone. Neither did he know where the pathless and illimitable forest to seek that smooth and lettered rock at the base of which the body lay. His remembrance of every portion of his travel thence was indistinct, and the latter part had left no impression upon his mind. There was, however, a continual impulse, a voice audible only to himself, commanding him to go forth and redeem his vow, and he had a strange impression that were he to make the trial he would lead straight to Malvin's bones. But year after year that summons, unheard but felt, was disobeyed. His one secret thought became like a chain binding down his spirit and like a serpent gnawing into his heart, and he was transformed into a sad and downcast yet irritable man. In the course of a few years after their marriage, changes began to be visible in the external prosperity of Reuben and Dorcas. The only riches of the former had been his stout heart and strong arm, but the latter, her father's sole heiress, had made her husband master of a farm under older cultivation, larger and better stocked than most of the frontier establishments. Reuben Bourne, however, was a neglectful husband, and while the lands of the other settlers became annually more fruitful, his deteriorated on the same proportion. The discouragements to agriculture were greatly lessened by the cessation of Indian war, during which men held the plow in one hand and the musket in the other, and were fortunate if the products of their dangerous labor were not destroyed, either in the field or in the barn by the savage enemy. But Reuben did not profit by the altered condition of the country, nor can it be denied that his intervals of industrious attention to his affairs were but scantily rewarded with success. The irritability by which he had recently become distinguished was another cause of his declining prosperity, as it occasioned frequent quarrels in his unavoidable intercourse with the neighboring settlers. The results of these were innumerable lawsuits, for the people of New England in the early stages and wildest circumstances of the country adopted whenever attainable the legal mode of deciding their differences. To be brief, the world did not go well with Reuben Bourne, and though not till many years after his marriage he was finally a ruined man, with but one remaining expedient against the evil fate that had pursued him, he was to throw sunlight into some deep recess of the forest and seek subsistence from the virgin bosom of the wilderness. The only child of Reuben and Dorcas was a son now arrived at the age of fifteen years beautiful in youth and giving promise of a glorious manhood. He is peculiarly qualified for and already begun to excel in the wild accomplishments of frontier life. His foot was fleet, his aim true, his apprehension quick, and his heart glad and high. And all who anticipated the return of Indian war spoke of Cyrus born as a future leader in the land. The boy was loved by his father with a deep and silent strength, as if whatever was good and happy in his own nature had been transferred to his child carrying his affections with it. Even Dorcas, though loving and beloved, was far less dear to him, 
for Reuben's secret thoughts and insulated emotions had gradually made him a selfish man, and he could no longer love deeply, except where he saw or imagined some reflection or likeness of his own mind. In Cyrus he recognized what he had himself been in other days, and at intervals he seemed to partake of the boy's spirit, and to be revived the fresh and happy life. Reuben was accompanied by his son in the expedition, for the purpose of selecting a tract of land and felling and burning the timber, which necessarily preceded the removal of the household gods. Two months of autumn were thus occupied, after which Reuben Bourne and his young hunter returned to spend their last winter in the settlements. It was early in the month of May that the little family snapped asunder whatever tendrils of affections had clung to inanimate objects, and bade farewell to the few who, in the blight of fortune, called themselves their friends. The sadness of the parting moment had to each of the pilgrims its peculiar allevi alleviations. Reuben, a moody man and misanthropic because unhappy, strode onward with his usual stern brow and downcast eye, feeling few regrets and disdaining to acknowledge any. Dorcas, while she wept abundantly over broken ties by which her simple and affectionate nature had bound itself to everything, felt that the inhabitants of her inmost heart moved on with her, and that all else would be supplied wherever she might go and the boy dashed one teardrop from his eye and thought of the adventurous pleasures of the untrodden forest. Oh, who in the enthusiasm of a daydream has not wished that there were a wanderer in the world of summer wilderness, with one fair and gentle being hanging lightly on his arm? In youth his free and exulting step would know no barrier but the rolling ocean or the snow-topped mountains. Calmer manhood would choose a home where nature had strewn a double wealth in the veil of some transparent stream. And when hoary age, after long, long years of that pure life, stole on and found him there, it would find him the father of a race, the patriarch of a people, the founder of a mighty nation yet to be. When death like the sweet sleep which we welcome after a day of happiness came over him, his far descendants would mourn over the venerated dust. Enveloped by tradition and mysterious attributes, the men of future generations would call him godlike, and remote posterity would see him standing dimly glorious far up the valley of a hundred centuries. The tangled and gloomy forest through which the personages of my tale were wandering differed widely from the dreamer's land of fantasy. Yet there was something in their way of life that nature asserted as her own, and the gnawing cares which sent with them from the world were all that now obstructed their happiness. One stout and shaggy steed, the bearer of all their wealth, did not shrink from the added weight of Dorcas. Although her hearty breeding sustained her, during the latter part of each day's journey by her husband's side. Reuben and his son, their muskets on their shoulders, and their axes slung behind them, kept an unwearied pace, each watching with a hunter's eye for the game that supplied their food. When hunger bade, they halted and prepared their meal on the bank of some unpolluted forest brook, which, as they knelt down with thirsty lips to drink, murmured a sweet unwillingness, like a maiden at love's first kiss. They slept beneath a hut of branches, and awoke at peep of light refreshed for the toils of another day. Dorcas and the boy went on joyously, and even Reuben's spirit shone at intervals with an outward gladness. But inwardly there was a cold, cold sorrow which he compared to the snowdrifts lying deep in the glens and howls of the rivulets, while the leaves were brightly green above. Cyrus, born was sufficiently skilled in the travel of the woods, to observe that his father did not adhere to the course they had pursued in their expedition of the preceding autumn. They were now keeping farther to the north, striking out more directly from the settlements and into a region of which savage beasts and savage men were as yet the sole possessors. The boy sometimes hinted his opinions on the subject, and Reuben listened attentively, and once or twice altered the direction of their march in accordance with his son's counsel. But having so done, he seemed ill at ease. His quick and wandering glances were sent forward apparently in search of enemies lurking behind tree trunks, and seeing nothing there. He would cast his eyes backwards as if in fear of some pursuer. Cyrus, perceiving that his father gradually resumed the old direction, forbore to interfere, nor, though something began to weigh upon his heart to his adventurous nature, permit him to regret the increased length and the mystery of their way. On the afternoon of the fifth day they halted and made their simple encampment nearly an hour before sunset. The face of the country for the last few miles had been diversified by swells of land resembling huge waves of a petrified sea, and in one of the corresponding hollows a wild and romantic spot had the family reared their hut and kindled their fire. There is something chilling and yet heartwarming in the thought of these three, united by strong bands of love and insulated from all that breathed beside. 
The dark and gloomy pines looked down upon them, and as the wind swept through their tops, a pitying sound was heard in the forest. Or did those old trees groan in fear that men were to come to lay the axe to their roots at last? Reuben and his son, while Dorcas made ready their meal, proposed to wander out in search of game, of which that day's march had afforded no supply. The boy, promising not to quit the vicinity of the encampment, bounded off with step as light and elastic as that of the deer he hoped to slay. While his father, feeling a transient happiness as he gazed after him, was about to pursue an opposite direction. Dorcas in the meanwhile had seated herself near the fire of fallen branches upon the moss-grown and moldering trunk of a tree, uprooted years before. Her employment, diversified by an occasional glance at the pot, now beginning to simmer over the blaze, was the perusal of the current year's Massachusetts Almanac, which was the exception of an old black-letter Bible, comprised all the literary wealth of the family. None pay a greater regard to arbitrary divisions of time than those who are excluded from society. And Dorcas mentioned as if the information were of importance, it was now the 12th of May. Her husband started. The 12th of May. Well, I should remember it well, muttered he, while many thoughts occasioned a momentary confusion in his mind. Where am I? Whither am I wandering? Where did I leave him? Dorcas, too well accustomed to her husband's wayward moods to note any peculiarity of demeanor, now laid aside the almanac and addressed him in that mournful tone which the tender-hearted appropriate to griefs long cold and dead. It was near this time a month, eighteen years ago, that my poor father left this world for a better. He had a kind arm to hold his head and a kind voice to cheer him, Reuben, in his last moments. And the thought of the faithful care you took of him has comforted me many a time since. Oh, death would have been awful to a solitary man in a wild place like this. Pray heaven, Dorcas, said Reuben in a broken voice. Pray heaven that neither of us three dies solitary and lies unburied in this howling wilderness. And he hastened away, leaving her to watch the fire beneath the gloomy pines. Reuben Bourne's rapid pace gradually slackened as the pang, unintentionally inflicted by the words of Dorcas, became less acute. Many strange reflections, however, thronged upon him, and strained onward rather like a sleepwalker than a hunter, it was attributable to no care of his own that his devious course kept him in the vicinity of the encampment. His steps were imperceptibly led almost in a circle, nor did he observe that he was on the verge of a tract of land heavily timbered, but not with pine trees. The place of the latter was here supplied by oaks and other of the harder woods, and around their roots clustered a dense and bushy undergrowth, leaving, however, barren spaces between the trees, thick strewn with withered leaves. Whenever the rustling of the branches or the creaking of the trunks made a sound, as if the forest were waking from slumber, Reuben instinctively raised the musket that rested on his arm and cast a quick, sharp glance on every side. But, convinced by a partial observation that no animal was near, he would again give himself up to his thoughts. He was musing on the strange influence that had led him away from his premeditated course, and so far into the depths of the wilderness. Unable to penetrate to the secret place of his soul where his motives lay hidden, he believed that a supernatural voice had called him onward, and that a supernatural power had obstructed his retreat. He trusted it was heaven's intent to afford him an opportunity of expiating his sin. He hoped he might find the bones so long unburied, and that, having laid the earth over them, peace would throw its sunlight into the sepulchre of his heart. From these thoughts he was aroused by a rustling in the forest at some distance from the spot to which he had wandered. Perceiving the motion of some object behind a thick veil of undergrowth, he fired with the instinct of a hunter and the aim of a practiced marksman. A low moan which told his success, and by which even the animals can express their dying agony, was unheeded by Reuben Bourne. What were the recollections now breaking upon him? Well, the thicket into which Reuben had fired was near the summit of a swell of land that was clustered around the base of a rock, which in the shape and smoothness of one of its surfaces was not unlike a gigantic gravestone. As if reflected in a mirror, its likeness was in Reuben's memory. He even recognized the veins which seemed to form an inscription in forgotten characters. Everything remained the same except that a thick covert of bushes shrouded the lower part of the rock and would have hidden Roger Melvin had he still been sitting there. Yet in the next moment, Reuben's eye was caught by another change that time had effected since he last stood where he was now standing again, behind the earthly roots of the upturned tree. The sapling to which he had bound the bloodstained symbol of his vow had increased and strengthened into an oak, far indeed from its maturity but with no mean spread of shadowy branches. There was one singularity observable in this tree which made Reuben tremble. The middle and lower branches were luxuriant life, and an excess of vegetation had fringed the trunk almost to the ground but a blight had apparently stricken the upper part of the oak, and the very topmost bough was withered, sapless, and utterly dead. 
Well, Reuben remembered how the little banner had fluttered on that topmost bough when it was green and lovely eighteen years before, whose guilt had blasted it. Well, Dorcas, after her departure of two hunters, continued her preparations for the evening repast. Her sylvan table was the moss-covered trunk of a large fallen tree, on the broadest part of which she had spread a snow-white cloth and arranged what were left of the bright pewter vessels that had been her pride in the settlements. It had a strange aspect that one little spot of homely comfort in the desolate heart of nature. The sunshine yet lingered upon the higher branches of the trees that grew on rising ground. But the shadows of evening had deepened into the hollow where the encampment was made, and the firelight began to redden as it gleamed up the tall trunks of the pines or hovered on the dense and obscure mass of foliage that circled round the spot. The heart of Dorcas was not sad, for she felt it was better to journey in the wilderness with two whom she loved than to be a lonely woman in a crowd that cared not for her. As she busied herself in arranging seats of moldering wood covered with leaves for Reuben and her son, her voice danced through the gloomy forest in the measure of a song that she'd learned in youth. The rude melody, in a production of a bard who'd won no name, was descriptive of a winter evening in a frontier cottage, when, secured from savage inroad by a high-piled snowdrift, the family rejoiced by their own fireside. The whole song possessed the nameless charm peculiar to unborrowed thought, but four continually recurring lines shone out from the rest like the blaze of a hearth whose joys they celebrated. Into them, working magic with a few simple words, the poet had instilled the very essence of domestic love and household happiness, and they were poetry and picture joined in one. Well, as Dorcas sang, the walls of her forsaken home seemed to encircle her. She no longer saw the gloomy pines nor heard the wind which still as she began each verse sent heavy breath through the branches and died away in a hollow moan from the burden of the song. She was aroused by the report of a gun in the vicinity of the encampment. Neither the sudden sound or her loneliness by the glowing fire caused her to tremble violently. The next moment she laughed in the pride of a mother's heart. "'Oh, my beautiful young hunter, my boy has slain a deer,' she exclaimed, recollecting the direction whence the shot preceded Cyrus had gone into the chase. She waited a reasonable time to hear her son's light step bounding over the rustling leaves to tell of his success. But he did not immediately appear. And she sent her cheerful voice among the trees in search of him. "'Cyrus? Cyrus?' His coming was still delayed, and she determined, as the report had apparently been very near, to seek for him in person. Her assistance also might be necessary in bringing home the venison which she flattered herself he had obtained. She therefore set forward, directing her steps by the long past sound, and singing as she went, in order that the boy might be aware of her approach and run to meet her. From behind the trunk of every tree and from every hiding place in the thick foliage of the undergrowth, she hoped to discover the countenance of her son, laughing with the sport of mischief that is born of affection. The sun was now beneath the horizon, and the light that came down among the leaves was sufficiently dim to create many illusions in her expecting fancy. Several times she seemed indistinctly to see his face, gazing out from among the leaves, and once she imagined she stood, he stood beckoning to her at the base of a craggy rock. Keeping her eyes on this subject, however, it proved to be no more than the trunk of an oak, fringed to the very ground with little branches, one of which thrust out farther than the rest and was shaken by the breeze. Making her way round to the foot of the rock, she suddenly found herself close to her husband, who had approached her in another direction. Leaning upon the butt of his gun, the muzzle of which rested upon the withered leaves, he was apparently absorbed in the contemplation of some object at his feet. "'How is this, Reuben? Have you slain the deer and fallen asleep over him?' exclaimed Dorcas, laughing cheerfully, on her first slight observation of his posture and appearance. He stirred not. Neither did he turn his eyes towards her, and a cold, shuddering fear indefinite in its source and object began to creep into her blood. She now perceived that her husband's face was ghastly pale, and his features were rigid as if incapable of assuming any other expression than the strong despair which had hardened upon them. He gave not the slightest evidence that he was aware of her approach. "'For the love of heaven, Reuben, speak to me!' cried Dorcas, and the strange sound of her own voice affrighted her even more than the dead silence. Her husband started stared into her face, drew her to the front of the rock, and pointed with his finger. There lay the boy, asleep but dreamless upon the fallen forest leaves. His cheek rested upon his arm. His curled locks were thrown back from his brow. His limbs were slightly relaxed. What, had a sudden weariness overcome the youthful hunter? Would his mother's voice arouse him? She knew it was death. This broad rock is the gravestone of your near kindred, Dorcas, said her husband. Your tears will fall at once over your father and your son. She heard him not. With one wild shriek that seemed to force its way from the sufferer's inmost soul, she sank insensible by the side of her dead boy. 
At that moment, the withered topmost bough of the oak loosened itself in the stilly air and fell in soft, light fragments upon the rock, upon the leaves, upon Reuben, upon his wife and child, and upon Roger Melvin's bones. Then Reuben's heart was stricken and the tears gushed out like water from a rock. The vow that the wounded youth had made the blighted man had come to redeem. His sin was expiated. The curse was gone from him. And in the hour which he had shed blood dearer to him than his own, a prayer, the first for years, went up to heaven from the lips of Reuben Bourne.